Hi, I'm Gordon, and now I'm going to read an extract from Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. A little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. Aye, aye, mate, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest. And then the whole crew bore chorus. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. And at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment, it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the anchor was short up, soon it was hanging, dripping at the bows, and soon the sails began to draw and the land and shipping to flip by on either side. And before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the island of treasure. I'm not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship and the crew were capable seamen. And the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise. For it is my belief that there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as, for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come of it yet, the captain said to Dr. Liversey. Spoiled forecastle hands make devils, that's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear. For if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get the wind of the island we were after. I'm not allowed to be more plain. And now we were running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage by the largest computation. Sometime that night, or at latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading south-southwest and had a steady breeze, a beam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing a low and aloft. Everyone was in the bravest spirits because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, with all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and around the sides of the ship. In I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left, but sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by, the barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there trembling and listening in the extreme of fear and curiosity, for from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended on me alone. The appearance of the island when I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of wager in the night and were now lying becalmed about half a mile to the southeast of the low eastern coast. Grey coloured woods covered a large part of the surface. This even tint was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sandbrake in the lowest lands and by many tall trees of the pine family outtopping the others, some singly, some in clumps, but the general colouring was uniform and sad. The hills ran up clear above the vegetation in spires of naked rock, all were strangely shaped. And the spyglass, which was by three or four hundred feet the tallest on the island, was likewise the strangest in configuration, running up sheer from almost every side and then suddenly cut off 
at the top, like a pedestal to put a statue on. The Hispaniola was rolling, scuppers under in the ocean swell. The booms were tearing at the blocks. The rudder was banging to and fro, and the whole ship creaking, groaning and jumping like a manufactory. I had to cling tight to the backstay, and the world turned giddily before my eyes. For though I was a good enough sailor, when there was way on, this standing still and being rolled about like a bottle was a thing I never learned to stand without a qualm or so, above all in the morning on an empty stomach. Perhaps it was this, perhaps it was the look of the island with its grey melancholy woods and wild stone spires and a surf that we could both see and hear foaming and thundering on the steep beach at least. Although the sun shone bright and hot and the shorebirds were fishing and crying all around us and you would have thought anyone would have been glad to get to land after being so long at sea, my heart sank, as the saying is, into my boots and from that first look onward I hated the very thought of Treasure Island.